there, you are cruising. Step four, we're talking about key attachments. All right, so we're recapping here. You've read your funding guidelines. You prepared the narrative skeleton. You are going to develop a great schedule, host a super rock and kickoff meeting, knock out that budget like a boss, and now it's time to prepare, prepare key attachments. Now, here's what you need to know. Every grant application requires different attachments. So we're not covering all of them, but we are gonna cover the most common ones that you can anticipate and uh, then just recognize that you're always going to yield first to your field, your funding guidelines to inform you know, what attachments are required. Resolution. What is that? A resolution to submit a grant is usually required either when you apply or when you're receiving funding and they say they're going to give you an award. And the idea is that it's approval from the highest in command at your organization saying, yes, we are behind this. We agree that we are submitting this grant application because some organizations are very large. And so you wouldn't want to be accepting an application and your board of directors don't actually have a clue. So here is the resolution template that we provide in the course. And it basically just shows you like a kind of classic way to funk, to lay out an app, a resolution that is both, you know, compelling and establishes urgency. And then also has all of the information that you might need to be including in your resolution, which sometimes includes what your cost share contribution will be. So that's why getting your budget done is so important because you can't, if you need to provide 20% match and you don't know how much your project costs, then you can't figure out how much match you need to commit to, right? So that's why it's important to knock this out. Another thing I want you to be aware of is that often a resolution that's passed by your city council or tribal council, board of directors, etc., they might only meet once a month. So that's why it's important to be way ahead of grant deadlines so that you've got enough time to get this resolution in front of them and have it approved so that you're not like scrambling and begging them to pass like an emergency meeting so that they'll approve your resolution because that just does not look good for you. So when you are preparing your resolution, I guess I kind of just talked about this, but again, you're going to just read the funding guidelines to inform how you prepare that. I wanna give, you, give yourself plenty of time, always put it on organization letterhead. And I guess the last kind of pro tip here is your organization already passes resolutions. So you can always go get a copy of one of those and that can help inform your layout and design. Now, letters of support. These are my favorite attachment, potentially my favorite part of the whole grant writing process, frankly, because it's where you get to pour all of this extra heart and frankly, like free narrative content into your application because people will write the most beautiful, wonderful letters of support if you give them kind of the sandbox to play in. Um, obviously I'm kind of passionate about this topic and I could go way deep, but essentially a letter of support is from stakeholders and partners that are saying, yes, we support this grant application. We urge you to fund them. It is very much needed. Just again, we're yielding to those funding guidelines. They're not always required or allowed. So you want to make sure that you're tuned into what is allowed. Now, if you're pursuing federal grants or more competitive grants, you want a custom letter for that funding pursuit that calls out specifically like, we support the city of Detroit in pursuing this environmental protection agency Brownfield grant, right? They needed to be naming the program the year. If you're pursuing smaller foundation grants, it's totally okay to have them be a little bit more general in terms of support for the project. And then you can reuse those letters, but just a little slight nuance. So we uh, described this whole developing and getting really amazing letters of support in grant writing from start to funded in a lot more detail, but I'm not going to overwhelm you with all of the steps right now. And I'm going to give you the first step. That's what you need to really get started on the right foot. And that is developing your contact list. So you want, you can get that going right now. There is no reason to hold yourself up. So you can start building out a list of names and organizations, emails, address, all that information, the relationship. Is it a relationship you have with the organization? Maybe it's one your executive director has with another executive director, right? And you want to start getting all of that information and you want at least 20 people on this list. 
because not everyone is going to respond to your, I mean, you're not gonna get 100% response rate. You can get a pretty high response rate, but you're not gonna get everybody. So you want to have a longer list than you need, so you're definitely getting back at least 10 letters of support. I want you to be seeking as many different perspectives as you possibly can, including potentially some opposing views, like who would not support your project? And think about how you can blend them in and make sure that their voices are heard and they're a part of this planning process and they wouldn't hold anything up. Another sometimes limiting belief that we run into is if you're a really tiny organization, you might think, gosh, like there's like, who are we supposed to get letters of support from? Now think regionally, even if you're very rural and remote, there are organizations at the regional and statewide or um, Providence level that would be wanting to see you succeed and wanna see this project happen. So don't be limited by thinking you just have to ask like the people in your tiny community. And as I just said, you're gonna be targeting a list of 15 to 20 plus organizations. So you're getting back at least 10 letters of support. By the way, below, you can actually make a copy of this contact list and start working on that right now. Now, when you're trying to figure out who should we go get potential support letters from, I want you to be seeking diversity, right? So think about state departments and health and social services or the environment or transportation. Think about cultural art organizations like museums and heritage centers, art councils and the like or even neighborhood communities, um, even neighborhood councils, um, smaller organizations that might not be like a formal nonprofit, but they could still be kind of a formed organization. They make great letters of support. How about professional associations, job or skill training organizations, college and educational programs, and even other impacted businesses or nonprofit organizations. So that should be enough to get you started on the key attachments, like the two main ones that you can anticipate. We talk about all other ones in the, in the program, grant writing from start to funded, but these are the two biggies that take getting on top of as fast as possible. So go forth, build out your contact list, get a sample resolution so you've got that in your project folder and you're ready to move on to the next step. I'll see you in the next video.